Good evening and welcome to our live set of six, where we share the good, the, the great and the noteworthy of rugby league outside the heartlands. My name's Craig. And my name's Carl. And on this week's set of six, we'll be talking about the Hereford Harriers winning the wheelchair challenge. The Southern Conference League has kicked off. And obviously, we'll be talking about that rugby league outsider team, Hull FC. Okay, as always, welcome to our live set of six, where we've picked out six interesting news stories from around uh, the the world of rugby league. Um, we've also got Alex Smith with us, who has featured on the show before. Uh, he's the head coach of the Shrewsbury Lions, uh, and a load of other stuff which we're going to get into throughout the show. Um, before we get started, remember that this is an interactive show, so you can comment and we can share your comments throughout the show at any time. Bring it up on the screen. Um, so please do that. We always give ten. Uh, rugby league outsiders points to any the, the first person to comment which you can redeem absolutely nowhere on the internet so uh carl summarize this week in rugby league it's a proper rugby league outsider show this week because i think we have been a little bit guilty of not having as many stories outside the heartlands as a lot of the uh the, the community leagues are just sort of starting uh but yeah we've got some proper outsider stories this week including wheelchair rugby league um female officials midlands league southern conference league it's all in there yeah so uh, obviously we should take a little bit of time just to introduce our, our studio guest tonight um i love the idea of having a guest in the studio someone else to chat to get their point of view so alex if you can if you can in a couple of minutes just let us know you know how did you get into rugby league and and what do you do right now <laughs> uh how i got into rugby league's a very long story uh, you can go and listen to the podcast from last year to, oh, good to plug. Good plug. <laughs> um, but uh, right now I'm uh, coaching at the Shrewsbury Lions, a uh, junior rugby league club in Shrewsbury. Uh, we've got about 50 registered kids for this season um, and we are building up for a, a brand new season, just about to start uh, across the Midlands in the juniors. Really exciting. Had a, had a committee meeting last night for the, all, of the, um, all of the clubs. And there's some really good stuff in development about minimum standards and uh, you know, what we can do as a league to improve the number of uh, coaches and the number of volunteers that we've got. Um, and uh, a little bit of breaking news for you. Guys. Oh, I like no, it. A bit, bit, of, bit, of, get, bit of breaking Get the yellow news. banner out. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, we've got a, a festival series this year sponsored by uh, Paladin Sports. So the Midlands Junior Festival program that's already been agreed now. We're hoping to have one extra team, brand new team, uh, a team in Wolverhampton. So we've been working with Wolverhampton Rugby Club who are really keen to... Uh, to start doing some junior rugby league in the summer. They're very, very keen to have some activity in their club uh, in the off season for the rugby union season. So um, breaking news is that they're, uh, they've agreed now with, I've agreed with their chairman to run an under 13s team this year. So it should be a brand new, brand new uh, t junior team in the Midlands this year. Uh, and I'm right in thinking that, you know, like, like adult clubs, you know, if you can get clubs in the neighborhood, it just makes travel much more likely the, the idea of players, getting to play is just you know much there's a much greater chance of it happening yeah the what we're doing this year is splitting the midlands festivals east and west so every club's invited to all of them but in reality the west midlands clubs will probably go to the west festivals and and the east to the east so you know the first festival of the year is over in uh Bassett Law, right in the East Midlands. So a lot of the West Midlands club, including Shrewsbury Lions, probably won't go to that. But the more clubs we can get in the West, the better. So, you know, Shrewsbury, Telford, Wolverhampton, you know, Cove, Birmingham, New Ravens, you, you know, all within an hour, 45 minutes drive for each other. So it's looking really positive for uh, for uh, for recruiting because if you're trying to convince parents who are used to going 15 minutes down the road for yeah, their yeah, games, yeah. so we'll come and play some rugby league and it's a four hour round trip to these Midlands, you know, puts people off. So yeah, really good news for, for us. The more, more clubs we can get in the West Midlands, the, the more kids we can recruit. Well, welcome to, uh, to the studio. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we do want to get more guests in the studio as well. So if you've got a story to tell, you know, a club to plug, then give us a shout and we'll get you in the studio as well. Um, I've just got one more question actually for Alex. How do you feel that junior rugby league is in the Midlands at the minute? How do you think, because uh, certainly the adults rugby league, in the Midlands seems to be absolutely thriving. How, how's it going at the junior level? Uh, yeah, I, 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 probably a similar trajectory. I think uh, probably 
maybe eight years ago, the Midlands Junior Rugby League was really strong. There was development officers and lots of clubs putting teams in. Probably had a real drop then and, um, you know, lack of volunteers and lack of teams. We're now getting 500, you know, kids coming to festivals. Yeah, awesome. Uh, you know, on these big days and clubs from all over the Midlands, they're really good, fest uh, real, genuine you know, festival in every sense of the word. They're great days. There's rugby as far as you can see, food vans and out in the sun and, you know, parents having a really good time and, and siblings and everything else. So, yeah, rugby league in the middle of the junior level is really on the up and, and taking off really well. Um, and I think, um, you know, we're all really excited for this year. And what we're trying to do with the Midlands organisation, the Junior Rugby League um, Committee, uh, you know, these talk about minimum standards and a framework for what clubs should be aiming for if they want to come and run a junior team. You know, all of that stuff is really good for the Midlands because, you know, we can go to the RFL and say, here's our minimum standards framework. We need more coaches. We need more game day managers. We need more first aiders. You've got to help us provide these courses and get these guys trained up because we've got kids here. You know, Telford Raiders is a good example. They could probably put five teams out, yeah. uh, junior teams, but this year they're only putting one mm -hmm. because they haven't got enough coaches to, yeah. to run them. So, you know, the Midlands uh, potential for kids is, is massive and it could, we could be running, we could have 50%, 100% more kids tomorrow. Uh, if we could get more volunteers, you know, into the game and, and, and qualified and, and everything else. So, yes, it's in a good place, but we can go way further. Uh, just one quick question. Have they got a, have they got a name? Was, uh, Wolverhampton, what? Uh, well, not agreed yet. It, <laughs> There's been that many teams in Wolverhampton over years. <laughs> well, that, you've opened a can of worms yeah, there. I, know, I was wondering what it was going to be, you know. Yeah. Strap line out of darkness cometh the light. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Uh, they've had wizards and warlords at an adult level. In, in, you know, in the last sort of couple of decades. Uh, the last junior teams to play out of Wolverhampton were the Wasps. Uh, so that's kind of my working assumption, but I, you know, I, I'm going to let And then the guys... it was just Wolverhampton Rugby League. <laughs> yeah. After the Wasps. Yeah. So I'm going to let the guys at Wolverhampton Rugby Union Club sort of decide what they want to call that. They're, you know, it's their team. They're putting it in, they're coaching it. Um, so we'll let them, we'll, we'll give them as much support as we can from our side in terms of coaches and equipment and training and mentoring, but yeah, I'll let them decide on the name. All right. Okay. Well, good luck to Wolverhampton. Good luck to you, Alex, with your your kiddies rugby league. Obviously, you know you don't get any more grassroots than than that. So you're doing a great job. Um, right. Okay. Before we get into the rest of the episode, I'm just going to tee up our uh, Williams Weekly quotes this this week. We just thought we'd have a bit of a discussion on who you think is the most influential halfback in Super League right now. So get your little brains working not that you've got a little bit you know but get your brains working and um and we'll have a little bit of discussion with that and obviously get your comments in now to um to join the discussion so carl without further ado let's get into uh, into tackle one yeah tackle one so tara jones has been the first female official to officiate a professional rugby league game in the northern hemisphere as happened uh in the Southern Hemisphere before, but Tara's the the first official to, first female to referee a game. She officiated the game between Cornwall and Oldham this week. Um, and she's having a, a stellar career at the minute. She's sort of building blocks nicely. She she uh, officiated um, Super League games as a linesman, in goal judge. She was the first female to score at Wembley. She's now making history again as being the first female to to, to referee a professional game. Yeah, and it's, it's a massive step forward, isn't it, for, for women officials. I mean, there's lots going on about women playing the sport. Yep. Um, but to be an official, I suppose, that's almost a different, different you know, conversation. Well, conversation, but it's just a different thing, isn't it? I don't know even know the words I'm trying to, I'm trying to say, but... Um, you know why? You know, you know when she's doing well because nobody mentions the official. I'm just going to say that. that that's that's the, the the true mark of a, a great official. Like she's she's not mentioned because of her performances. Nobody nobody mentions it. it she's just she's a shocker. Yeah. No, she's just having a, a, a great career. She refed a Challenge Cup game. Yeah, it was the year, um, didn't she? Because it was on Army the, RF, was it? Or Army Navy or something and, like that? And, and I, had this, I thought the same thing. At, at the end of the game, I, all I could remember was the game and I couldn't remember the ref, which is perfect because she'd made the great decisions and didn't do didn't do anything that annoyed anybody and uh did a real i think she's a really good ref yeah so i know the politically correct answer but sh should she be more scrutinized to for being a, a female official or less scrutinized or or what i think she is quite scrutinized and will be but i think the fact that people haven't piled on at the end means that those people watching expecting her to be terrible were, were then 
Quite surprised that she was decent and, and then got back to watching the game, which is the whole point, right? Yeah, yeah. If it encourages more female officials... But it's got to, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great step forward for the game. Um, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it's got to because, you know, all of a sudden you've got you've got girls there that uh, some people, weirdly for me, because it's not my cup of tea, want to be officials, you know? And uh, now they could, there's a role model, isn't there, for them to, to go, right, okay, well, I can do that then, you know? And um, and as well as that, you know, say you've got ageing players or players that have just reached their peak and want but want to be involved in the sport in other ways. It's just a brilliant opportunity all around. So. Yeah, I think we'll see her move up the ranks in the next couple of years and it wouldn't surprise me if we see a sort of top end of Championship League one. Sorry, Super League within a couple of years. You think it should be Super League? Yeah. Alex? Mm. I don't see why not. I don't see <laughs> yeah, why not. No, no. I mean, you know, that... It, it's happened in uh, down in Australia. You know, some of the, the, the there's probably f three or four leading women yep. um, refs who have, have worked their way up, and we've had NRL games ref by women now, and, and they've done a great job. So yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, there's one in particular. I don't know her name, but she's absolutely fierce. Like you just wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know what I mean? You just wouldn't get on the wrong side of it. Here's Is a it? question for you: Do you think that past players uh, make the best officials? We actually addressed this, didn't we, in our referee episode back in Series 1? I don't think we addressed it, but we discussed it. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> there might be a difference. Um, it's obviously, she's, yeah. at the, she's at the top of her game in England International. Super League winning side. She's, you know, she's at the top of the game, both playing and, and refereeing. That, that doesn't exist in the men's game. No, and that might be for good reason. So I'm going to like the, the, what I'm, where I'm going to explain this, I'm going to come at it from a different angle. Right, so Go on. obviously my background is in the military and you think, all oh, right, military, used to handling weapons and all that, cross over to armed police. The armed police don't, want mili don't necessarily want to recruit military guys because they're too familiar with weapons. All right. You know, now obviously very different Super League refereeing, you know, and all that kind of thing. But is it the fact that they they almost know too much or they're... Do you know what I mean? I, I, there must be a reason why. Unless the yeah, player, the uh, not very good or whatever, but yeah, you know, we've I, got our first silence. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's just a discussion. Well, I think uh, discussion. I I think there's a benefit to being a player, which is you, you might get a, a bit less criticism aimed at you, and or you <clears throat> might be an assumption that you understand the players a bit better, and therefore, um, you know, you. you you would hope you could make some decisions based on the player's point of view a little bit more. Um, but I guess there might be a, a concern about um, current players and then refs around, you know, everyone has to follow the same consistent line. And, you know, would you want a ref who's been a player interpreting the rules slightly differently because they've been a player? Right. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's my point, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's not being a player, is it? It's actually is a, cur is a player. current player. Current so, player. yeah, you, you don't get that in many sports. Not at all. Uh, here's a little question, a little fun question for you. So, which player would you like to see be a referee? I've got oh, mine now. My, I, my, easy. Got, got it. Sam Tompkins. Sam Tompkins? <laughs> uh, yeah. Why? Because it'd just get loads of stick. No, Jake Connor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Even better. I go Mickey Mack or someone like that. Who's, was, who's, the, gonna... who's the uh, enemy of most? Macalorum as a referee. You imagine that. Would be funny. They're like no old, no, no old bad. You're like no, play on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, we'll, we'll move on. Attack. Oh, well, we've got the uh, the League One results as well. So she refereed Cornwall versus Oldham. Cornwall put a good fight again, which is a bit of a reoccurring theme for them this year. So uh, Oldham. The favourite to win League One this year could quite easily run away with it. Uh, but yeah, I'll, so come on, give them a bit of a run for the money first sort of 25 30 minutes, want many points in it, and then they, they sort of bloom away at the end. Uh, saw the interview with Sean Long, wasn't too happy after the no. game. Oh. Um, what about it, just the, the consistency okay. that they, they, they were playing with? The it, they sort of um, let the standards slip, they got very high standards, have they? All them, yeah, for this year. Um, you know, Col Cornwall haven't won yet this year. Is that they sort of finished last year very strong? But I, d I do think they've got a, a result coming. Um, well, it, it took them like three or four games to get into it last year, didn't it? Yeah, and they, they sort of finished the season strong, didn't they? Um, another coach that was uh, even 
less happy. Yeah, less less happy than um, Sean Long was Mark Dunning. I saw the interview with Mark Dunning after the game. Um, and although he remained incredibly professional, as he always does, says all the right things, you could see the rage burning between his eyes. Um, well, the, the feeling that they perhaps let that game... They did. They definitely get away let it them. slip. If, um, I've spoke to a couple of people who were there. Um, Hurricanes were in a very comfortable lead at half-time. Um, I think Didn't they score in the second half, did they? No, I think they were sort of 26 points to 6 up or 26 points to 10 up at half-time. Um, and absolutely chucked that game away in the second half. Uh, 26 points to 30 to finish off. Um, other results? Corn, what? No, not Corn. Keith Cougars, they're flying high at the top of the table. Uh, Crusaders have been doing really well. They're top three at the minute, um, but they weren't strong enough to take on the Cougars at this weekend. There's the, the league table. Newcastle Thunder down the bottom. They're going to have an incredibly difficult season. Them and London Broncos yeah. going for the least wins. Yeah, and unfortunately, it's it, it mirrors last season's table. So you've got the the outsider teams um, down the bottom end of the table. I think everyone's expected a little more from the Hurricanes this year, but you do have North Wales Crusaders um, going strong, top three. See how they carry on the season. And this week, we've got Hurricanes v Cornwall. So it'll be interesting to see who comes out on top in that one. Well, the Hurricanes nearly beat the Crusaders a few weeks back, didn't they? Yeah. Just and close. So, yeah. you know, the Hurricanes have had some really close results this year. So they just don't close any off. The table's they? a bit harsh on them. Yeah, it is. it is harsh. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to tackle two now, a bit of wheelchair uh, news with uh, another former guest as well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll crack onto that in a minute, but Hereford Harriers won the wheelchair challenge, which took place in, was it Manchester, I believe? I think it was in Manchester. I could be wrong there. Uh, so, yeah, there was 15 teams invited to take part in this tournament uh, from all over the UK, uh, from Scotland to, to the south. Um, all vying for the top two teams got a place in the Challenge Cup. Uh, we also spoke to Martin Gill, who's the, the head coach of the Edinburgh Giants, uh, who we had as a previous guest last year. Um, they, went out, they went down in the final 16 points to 17 against Hereford. Harriers, which uh, a drop goal sealed the win there for Hereford in the in stoppage time. Yeah, apparently by all accounts, really, really close game. Um, but uh, you know, both teams delighted to be in the Challenge Cup. Yeah, and, and just geographically, two clubs that you wouldn't see um, in the Challenge Cup in in the in, that, in the men's or the women's. So that it's it's great that we've got this. Wheelchair game is he's, he's, he's spreading all over the UK and it continues to do so. Yeah, so we've got we caught up with Martin Gill to um, to get his take on what it means to be in the Challenge Cup now and also what obstacles it brings to a club that remember only launched last year. You know, this is maiden, maiden season. Um, as always, he, spe he speaks incredibly well. So uh, let's just take a listen. To okay, that. here we are with Martin Gill from Edinburgh Giants, uh, a new new wheelchair team that was set up last year. We spoke to him before. In fact, he was our first ever guest of the guest of the year, wasn't he? Yeah, we're going to say you need to give him his correct title. 2023 Rugby League Outsiders Guest of the Year. Martin, welcome to the show again. Thanks, guys. Uh, Martin, so fantastic year for you last year. Um, club was just getting off the ground last time we spoke to you. Um, you put a lot of wheels in motion and now you've just come out of the wheelchair challenge and qualified for the Challenge Cup. How did all that come about? Yeah, so we, we made a decision that we was going to enter the Challenge Trophy this year just as a bit of a measuring stick, if I'm completely honest. Um, obviously, we had a few games uh, last season up here in Scotland and we just kind of wanted to just to test the waters. Obviously, we, we've got long-term ambitions of where we want to get to and, yeah, we just really wanted to, to have, a, have a dig and see where we were at. And for anyone who hasn't seen it, who which were the teams that were were in the um, the, the play? Well, the the, the tournament, mate. Um, so there's 15 teams in total. So in our group, we had uh, the Hereford Harriers, uh, Rochdale Hornets, Woodland Warriors, um, and Salford Red Devils. And then obviously in the other groups, you, you had other teams from around the championship and the, the regional teams. So there's three groups in total. Martin, I wonder what 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 were your words to your players at the end of the at the end of the game, or when you got the news that you're going to be in the, the Challenge Cup? Yeah, I, I think for us, for every game that went by, obviously the the confidence confidence grew. But we spoke about it before we went down, and, and genuinely, probably for the first time, we didn't set any expectations. Um, we just wanted to go down there and 
and enjoy the day and you know as I said just play some rugby league and see where we were at but for, for every game that went by the, the confidence grew and once we knew we'd we won the group we were kind of saying right let's let's, let's go for it let's have a let's have a dig um, but yeah once we'd, we we already knew um, if we made it to the final that we'd if we won it we'd face Leeds Rhinos or if we um, if we finished winner up we'd we'd face London so obviously the the heart kind of wanted to win it for for two reasons for the club and obviously back to my old stomping ground. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know we're just really you know we're just really happy that we've that we've managed to qualify. I think obviously it's come a lot sooner than we we thought. We know it's going to be a, a real tough test for us, but yeah, you know just delighted in the progress that we've made over the last twelve months. And the final was a incredibly close game, wasn't it? You 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 bowed out by a drop goal in the last second, I believe. That must um, have been. So it it went to sudden death. Um, we finished sixteen all at full time, um, and, a, and a toss of the coin. We lost the lost the flip, um, so we didn't actually get to touch the ball in the in sudden death. But fair play to Hereford, the the work they set and put themselves in a position for the drop goal. And, and unfortunately for us, it it went over. And Martin, now you've qualified for the Challenge Cup. I know, sort of speaking to you off air, it, this comes with a whole host of new challenges, doesn't it? Yeah, it brings brings everything. Obviously, for us as a as a club, the rugby side is probably growing a lot quicker than the, the club side. We're obviously still quite new and getting the business side of it right. Obviously, it comes with the financial implications of another another away trip. Um, I'm jumping on a on a management meeting straight after this just to discuss it, um, just to see what that strategy looks like. But for us, it's just a case of making it happen. I think that's the that's the ethos that we've got. We're we're not going to turn the opportunity down to take part in the uh, prestigious Challenge Cup. So we'll we'll make it work. But obviously, it needs to be to be worked through. Martin, I, I assume a lot of success is down to a high calibre coach, but I also know that there'll be, you know, top players there as well. Who are your players that have kind of stood out in your in your maiden season? So I, I think for me, I'm not I'm not going to genuinely mention any names because I think for for me the whole squad's just had a massive dig. We've we've had players that have never played the sport before. Um, I think even including the minutes that we played at the weekend, we're still less than nine games. Nine, nine full games if you look at the overall minutes that we've played um, we've managed to recruit some some strength in the off season um, some players that have played the game before which obviously bolstered the squad and had a little bit of experience but genuinely I think from from one to nine that took to the took to the park on, on Sunday I, I couldn't choose anybody because it, everybody had a valid contribution in each and every single of the games to, to get us to the to the final Martin, just last question for me, really. But what's the what's the trend of wheelchair rugby? Obviously, we spoke we spoke last year, and you know it's all looking really positive. Has that continued? Is it continuing to grow? Yeah, I think there's still a lot of positivity around it. Obviously, it's still one of the most expensive versions of adapted adapted sports, or probably the most uh, expensive version of of rugby league. But there just seems to be a real buzz around it still. I think there's that um, legacy from the, the from the World Cup rumbles on. There's still more clubs forming. There's still more people getting getting taking part and getting active. Um, but you've still got a lot of people still flying the flag and wanting to keep that momentum up. Um, obviously, we're trying to do our bit north of the north of the border. But there's still a, a lot of fantastic work happening. That I think events like Sunday are only gonna are only gonna help that when you've got 15 teams all under one roof. Um, Building those relationships off the pitch, but then getting down to business and you know looking to develop themselves as, as players and as clubs. Martin, last question from me, mate. The uh, London Roosters that you're up again. Are you going with any sort of expectations to that game, or is it just a free hit for you guys? I think London Roosters is obviously an established Super League team with World Cup winners in there, so they're going to be red hot favourites. Um, I wouldn't say it's a free hit. I think obviously we want to go down there and give a good account of ourselves, but equally we'll, we know that they're the red-hot favourites. And I think for us, again, it's just another opportunity to get some minutes under his belt and, and see where we're at. Um, don't want to write us off because that's not in the mentality, but equally, you know, obviously if you look at the pedigree of the, the Roosters, then the, if I was a betting man, I'd be, you'd obviously be putting a bet on them to, to get through to the semi-finals. But we're going to go down there and, and have a dig and see where we're at. That's all we can do. And Martin, if, if anyone's watching this and they, they feel they want to get involved or they want to help out, you know, with this uh, Challenge Cup run, um, how, what's the best way for people to get in touch? Yeah, so they can obviously go onto the website, which is edinburghgiants.org. Um, from there, there's a range of information on the website and you'll be able to get in contact with us via email. Um, or just plug in Edinburgh Giants into any of the social media channels and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pop up, um, just drop us a message and we'll be more than happy to 
to reach out, whether it's the volunteer players or some sponsors, some companies that want to get behind us and help us build the club. Amazing. Yeah, Martin, thank you very much for coming on. Um, we'll keep an eye out, obviously, on the um, on the, the fixtures ahead. And, and best of luck, mate. Cheers, guys. Thanks good, very much. Good luck, Martin. Take Cheers, care. mate. Yeah, I loved listening to Martin Gilly. He always talks a lot of sense. Um, by the way, lots of people watching online right now, and I've got to shout, got to give a shout out to uh, everybody that watches the Rugby League Outsiders. We hit seventy five thousand um, views uh, just the other day, and uh, subscribers keep going up and up and up. And it, that, subscribing to this channel really is the best way to let us know that what we're turning out is good and interesting. So please, if you haven't done so. Then, uh, then do Alex. You had a comment on um, uh, about Her about rugby league in Hereford. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know a lot about the Hereford Harriers, um, but I think it's interesting that there's no rugby league in that part of the world. You know, they're, they're based at a rugby union club, and I, I googled them today, um, and you know, they interestingly refer to what they do as uh, wheelchair tag rugby rather than wheelchair rugby league. Uh, and you know, maybe you guys can. See if we can get them on to to, to talk. And I, I don't, like I said, I don't know. Absolutely don't know. I don't know anything about them. But I wonder whether they were a rugby union, a wheelchair rugby union team who play the sort of that murder ball version of of, of wheelchair rugby with a round ball, uh, and had all the kit, and then saw wheelchair rugby league and thought actually that looks like a good game, and and have, have now turned obviously into a very good team because they've won the challenge trophy. It's a, it'd be interesting to see their journey and whether and whether other rugby union wheelchair teams might be doing a similar thing yeah, yeah. well if there's anybody watching uh i've reached out to Hereford before actually we'd love to love to get them on not too far from here um to be continued hopefully yeah i mean you're right in what you're saying there you know it's interesting you might think oh it's just any old name but all the wheelchair rugby league players and coaches we've spoke to are very quick to correct anybody that calls it wheelchair rugby. They don't like it. It's a different sport, completely different sport. It's not the same at all. So, you know, for them to call it tag rugby, there's something gone on. There's an evolution, some you know, gone on somewhere. So, yeah, you're right. It's probably an interesting story, that. But, but, but I wonder if it's a potential source of growth for the sport because, you know, Martin in that clip just now talked about how, was, how expensive it was. It's a real big yeah. barrier to entry. But if there's... There's rugby clubs out there with all the wheelchairs and all the kit set up to play wheelchair rugby union, then you know, that could be a real source of new teams quite quickly, couldn't it? Well, it's a terrible version of it, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Let, let's be honest. Yeah. So, have, so, have you, have you ever seen it? Yeah, I've, I've seen it. Yeah, it's shocking. It's, it's weird. But what are you saying that like some clubs have had funding and you know, yeah. like a like a big push has been made to to set this up in the past? I would have. Yeah, I would have thought so. I mean. It, Rugby Union's wheelchair game's got more history. It's been around a bit longer than the Rugby League, so I would be amazed if there were, hadn't been some funding in the past. Mm. And therefore, you've got teams out there with with a with a load of wheelchairs that, but you that can, could turn their to turn you, them to the game. You can see why it's failed though, as well, because it's it's not rugby. It's not wheelchair yeah. rugby league is proper rugby. Yeah. Wheelchair yeah. rugby union or wheelchair rugby, whatever they call it. Uh, it just isn't rugby league. It's just not rugby. Uh, it doesn't resemble the game in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Whereas rugby league, one hundred percent, is rugby league. Okay, we're going to move on to what is possibly the biggest uh, story in, in certainly Super League right now. Uh, bizarre, completely. Bizarre. This is like our Area Fifty One story, isn't it? Yeah, the it's, big it's, it's the, the, the big red lights flashing on Hull FC at the minute. I have no idea what's going on with this club. Uh, so Richard Myler has been appointed as the, I'll get his title right, Director of Rugby at Hull FC. Um, like you've just said, Craig, this one came out of absolute nowhere this week. Um, there was mutterings sort of a, about a few days ago that, that he was getting this role. And then all of a sudden, York put out a statement that he'd retired. And then two minutes later, he was announced as the Hull FC Director of Rugby. Um, no press conference. The photograph they sent out, he was wearing a Leeds tie. It was just, the whole thing's just absolutely bizarre. Yeah, in our picture, it looks like he's got a Jewish cap on as well. So, <laughs> you know, it is, it is all a little bit bizarre. So, a little bit of like um, media Jenga going on there, isn't there? There's, it's obviously been leaked. Yeah. Do you think like Hull just needed some good news for the fans or, or, or what? I mean, where do you think this has come from? I don't know. Um, got a camera down. Oh. Huh. Just, just carry on because you pick up your sound. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. It was just, um, it was just an odd one. It was. I, I don't know where it's come from. I don't know. There, there are rumours that it's 
it's potential. He's up until only a few weeks ago still a player. Uh, it's really hard to imagine how he can go straight into that role. Um, um, and best of luck to him. I, you know, I, I wish him all the best. But it, there'll be a lot of people out there thinking, I don't know how he's gonna, how he's right got the right qualifications for that. Well, role. do you not think he's pretty ballsy from Richard Myler himself? Yeah. You know, to to he's brave. Yeah. To, to I mean, none of us know what his qualifications are, though, do we? I mean, no, we, we've got to be honest. There, we we don't know what he's been what he studies outside of rugby league and all the rest of it. No, no but there's not many coaches that, that end that kind of get involved with a, a club at that level straight away. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's not find the feet in a championship club or like take Paul Wellens, for example, he might've been like doing a little bit of coaching behind the scenes for years. And now he's you know, now he's found himself as a head coach and struggling by the way, I think. So <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's like, he hasn't gone in at the coaching level, has he? He's gone in another tier above that. Like director, yeah. that yeah. director of rugby is normally an ex-coach, right? It's yeah, it's someone who's the, either coached or been yeah, involved in the coaching setup. Long in the two. I mean, what is a director of rugby? I don't know. So it's, it's just a. It's just a. It's, just, it's, it's one of these. It's, like, it, it's like a phantom job that comes up every now and then. There's been so many of them, and they never last very long either. Jamie Peacock was a director of rugby. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Sinfield. Was at Leeds, wasn't it? That didn't last very long. There's been others. No, but that, that I think that was, he was drawn to Union then, Monte. But um, it seems uh, it seems like it's a, a almost a management layer between the money, the investors, and and the coach. And if I guess if it works in organisations where it works, it provides a really valuable buffer. But I guess where it hasn't worked out is it's been frustrating because the coach wants to know how much money he's got. Can't talk to the to the investors in the club and the director of rugby sort of, you know, interfering in the decisions the coach has got to make. And you can see how it goes wrong if it's not set up right. Oh, 100%. You can see how it goes wrong. Well, and that, that's my question. Like, where's Hull going to be in like 12 to 18 months? You know what I mean? We, it's just a, it's just a weird, well, the, weird the, setup. The, there's the, there's a whole rest of the story as well, though, isn't there? Like, you know, Tony Smith sacked on, what was it, Tuesday? Um, New Brown's gone. That is Tex gone. Oil's gone. gone. Um, like we said there were a club in crisis last week, but it seems like they're in even a worse situation. I don't know. Like it may turn out to be an absolute genius move. Yeah, but well, he can't from, from the outside looking in at the minute. It's a low bar start, isn't it? Like he, he low expectations right from the start. So you know he he, he can only go up. I suppose he it. can only go up <laughs> from there, can't you? Well, and and actually, I remember when Tony Smith went. I remember sitting there thinking. Well, who the hell wants that job now? You know, yeah. like it's not only like who's available, which is your normal question. It's like who wants it? Because Jesus, they, they've got a big job, massive job, you know. And like you said, they, maybe they just needed something that was an absolute banana, you know, just something completely left field that's that's going to. I suppose the only comparison you can put to it, it's not it quite the same, but. We, we had a similar sort of conversation when uh, Burgess was announced as the Warrington coach. We sort of said, that's a bit left field. That's completely out of the blue. Mm. Um, but if you look at that at the minute, how that's going, it's going quite well. Yeah. Yeah, but I can see that. I can see, you know, Sam, I can I can see the transition for Sam Burgess to Warrington Wolves and I can see the benefits that it brings. Mm. Sam had done some coaching. At yeah, decent it, level. he'd done yeah. some coaching. Yeah. Yeah. He was a great leader and everyone, yeah. everyone was saying, True. listen, you know, if he just brings his leadership skills to that club, then he's going to make an impact, you know. So, but with, with, with Richard Miller to go in at like the director of rugby level, I mean, it's just, 
it's just it's just weird. Unless he's unless they're happy with the coaches that have got that have stepped in whilst uh, Tony Smith's obviously been one thing. Out. One thing you can say about him, he's been playing at the top of his game for a lot of years. Mm. Yeah. He's England international. He's been he's been knocking around a good. Uh, I don't know how many years he's been to Super League. He's, it's got to be 10, 12, 13 years. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah he's, he's been knocking around Super League for, for years. So he's an incredibly experienced player. He'll, he'll know the industry inside out. It may turn out to be a genius move by Hull FC. Um, obviously, but people like ourselves are all going to criticise it and <laughs> pull it apart before it happens. I don't know if I'm criticising it or I'm just a bit bewildered Amused. by it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's yeah. Like, I don't really... Don't really understand it, but maybe there's more information to follow. You know, and if it does, you know, as speculation suggests, bring in a load of cash for Hull. Well, maybe it is a genius stroke. So, anyway, let's uh, let's crack on. We'll see how that unfolds over the next uh, couple of weeks. So from there, we're going to the Southern Conference League, Cal. Yeah, the Southern Conference League uh, kicked off this year, and now you've got to say the Southern Conference League, one of. Yeah, one of the biggest community leagues now in the country, I would say. It's right up with the, the National Conference League. Two teams in there that had great runs in the Challenge Cup with the Hammersmith and uh, the, the West Warriors. You've got the Bristol All Golds have come into, into the Southern Conference League this year from the, the West of England division. It just it just seems like a really strong league this year. Um, I've got a little bit of a look at the, at the results, Craig, if you bring them up. Oh, yeah, sorry. Bring up my comment there. Uh, yeah, so these are the weekend's results from round one. So uh, Eastern Rhinos 20, West Warriors 34, and then London Scholars. This was the surprise result. London Scholars, who have dropped down from League One, uh, fell short against the Bedford Tigers. Uh, so great result there for Bedford Tigers 38 points to 46. Uh, London Chargers 32, Brentwood Eels 10, and then we got the Hammersmith Hills Hoist Triple H against the Crusaders, which was 44 points to nil. Yeah, some big scores. Um, got a comment good, coming? Good teams in that league as well. Yeah, uh, so Matt's quiz, uh, I'm not sure who that is, but um, oh, he's basically saying all rugby union teams should start a league team for the summer, uh, which is a pretty bold statement, but I mean, there's... Matt, there's I, I would say to, that's... Uh, yeah, it's got to be... Uh, it's Matt from the Quantum, yeah. so if I was guessing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I thought that. Um, yeah, and it's, it's a great thing. There's, there's so many benefits having a league side, you know, during the summer, so it is a bold statement, but I truly believe it as well. But anyway, back to the Southern Conference League. Really looking forward to uh, how this league unfolds this year. Uh, Alex, former London Scholars, what was it, treasurer? Or I played, I played for them before or they went up to the uh, National Conference um, for three or four years. And then I was their treasurer and uh, coached their junior team. I actually coached their... Well, I don't think he's their current head coach, but he was up until next last year, Joe Mabu. Um, I coached him uh, during the through the junior ranks at the Scholars. So, yeah, I've got a really good, fond memories of my time down in London with the Scholars. Great club. Great club, great league. You've got to say that Summer Conference League this year is absolutely solid. Any idea who might come out on top? Oh, I think the two who went into the Challenge Cup. Are I'm a Smith and out. the West. And they, they would be, I, they're probably the favourites, but... Uh, you know, the sort of rugby league uh, heritage down in the in the south now with people travelling and wanting to be in London and, and playing their, their game. And, the, and the, the standard's always been high. You know, when I was playing down in, at the Scholars, the, the, there were very few weak teams <laughs> that you came up against. So it's good. Yeah, really looking forward to see how that unfolds. And um, while we're on it, Craig, uh, Brentwood Eels released, it was actually last week they released this, but I, I just thought we'd bring it up. Um, as we reviewed all the rugby league shirts this year, there is another one for us to review. Get your teeth stuck into that. What do you think? Do you know? I absolutely love it. I really love it. I love the I love the color scheme, like the muted um, blue, you know, and the and the bold kind of burnt orange color. You know, I think it's just a real, really stylish shirt. It's so, a it's a traditional V. With a bit of additional like mo modernization yeah. gradient on it, the sponsor is integrated. Yeah, it's all I knew you were going to say that. I was waiting for you yeah, to mention the sponsor that. integration. He's watched the previous episodes. <laughs> Look, I love it. I, I, I think that is a top class kit, and I am going to rate that a rugby league outsider's rating of nine out of ten. 
Yeah, no, I agree. I would even go as far as a 9.2. It's possibly one of the most stylish shirts I've seen this year. Really, really like it. Alex? Well, I really like it, but I, it's slightly bothering me that the, the badge and the crest on the other side are overlapping. I'd like them to be in the white section. I don't know why that just bothers me a little bit. Yeah, I'm taking a point off them. I, re <laughs> <laughs> I remember when London Broncos released the Brewdog sponsor, and the, and the, the sponsor bit. wasn't in the middle of the white bit, and he went, is this annoying you? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, great kit. Yeah, top good. top marks to uh, Brentwood Eels for that. Uh, yeah, and whilst we're on the subject of, uh, of kit reveals, oh, yes. uh, we've got our own personal, well, it's not our personal kit reveal, but... Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, we was invited to create a kit reveal for Telford Raiders men's and women's teams for, for the 2024 kit release. Uh, we've just been working on that the last past week. Look, I'm just going to stick it out there. I think it's going to it's going <laughs> to it's going to challenge most Super League teams kit reveals. I think. Yeah, and and you know my my thing with it is like it didn't take a lot of work. You know, there is a bit no. of work got into it, but it's not a lot of work. And and this is why I kind of I'd encourage even like amateur clubs, community clubs, just to put a bit more effort into what they're turning out because, you know, you might think, oh, well, who's looking at what we're doing and who's looking at what we're doing? But we saw a significant increase in the amount of players we're attracting to Telford Raiders. The interest we was getting from sponsors, all of a sudden, you know, yeah. we couldn't get sponsors before, really. Now we have multiple sponsors. Um, you know, so much more interest. We went to the, a friendly against the RAF Academy the other day, and there was 60-odd people watching. You know, and it's just, you think, oh, what's the, what's the point? But the point is, you know, we've got to be like... Social media is everything, isn't it? It's not everything. Uh, mm, I don't think it's, no, everything. it's not everything, but it's, it plays a huge part in in growing a, a sports brand these days because every everybody's they're, they're your they're your eyes on your club. Yeah, but what what I'm saying is, I think some community clubs don't see themselves as a brand, but you are. That's why you've got a playing strip. You know what I mean? That's why you've got a club house. You know what I mean? You you are a brand, and what I want to encourage people to do is just to put a bit more effort into that. I mean, even Wales today released their kit, didn't they? And it was basically... Yeah, it was just know. a picture of a shirt in 2D. Here's our new shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Try harder, Wales. Come on. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, and we all remember the, the witness fail from earlier this year yeah. where they just put two unironed shirts out on a mannequin. No, actually, I think it was worse than that. I think it, it was a picture of the shirt... On a wooden floor, laid out flat, and that was that's what they released to the world. Shocking. Yeah. You got to have higher standards than that. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Anyway, so that's coming out on it. It, drop, it releases on Friday. Yeah, um, high expectations, guys. When we see that, <laughs> I'm, 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 pressure's on. I'm expecting you know fireworks, smoke. Definitely smoke. There's <laughs> definitely smoke. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. There was there was a comment during the film, and uh, I think one of the girls turned around and said, um, you, uh, you know, what did you say? You said something about the smoke. You, you love a bit of smoke, you do. I was like, no more. I said, <laughs> get get more in. <laughs> get, get some more in. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Carl, just you know, just just tell people what what was kind of your thought process when you put the video together. Obviously, a bit tough because they haven't watched it yet, but um, yeah, I I really like the NRL videos. They always have sort of neon lights in the background, make it very smoky, make atmospheric, hard hitting music. I love all that sort of stuff, and that's what we that's what we went for. Dark shots, revealing the kit slowly, hard hitting, bit of slow motion. Loved it. Yeah, and that's exactly kind of what we've gone for. Um, so the watch it all the way to the end as well, because obviously it's quite stoic. It's quite tense, you know what I mean, throughout the video. And then we've added something just to kind of lighten it at the end, just to show you that we, you know, we're not taking it. We're not, we're not taking it like too, overly too serious. serious. Yeah. 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 Um, so make sure you watch it all the way to the end. Look out for that on Friday. Yeah, drops on Friday on our Telford Raiders social media channels. Um, and we'll probably throw it on the Outsiders channel as well. Okay, uh, next next tackle. So uh, England international June. Yeah, so this is breaking news. Really, it only dropped a couple of hours ago. So England international. Uh, it, both the men's and the women's teams are going to be taking on France uh, at the end of June for the French rugby league. They're celebrating ninety years of of rugby league. I think that we always knew this game was going to come along, um, but it's been announced today, and it's in Toulouse as well. So at least it's not in the UK. 
<laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, we've played we've played France in the UK loads of times, haven't we? At least it's in Toulouse. It's it's not in, it's not in Perpignan. It's t- the least are taking it to a different area. Yeah, great place to go on holiday. Yeah, I know we are. We are eyeing up a little break out there, aren't we? So I love a trip to the south of France to watch rugby league. Rugby have, have you been? Have you, have you yeah, done I the to, went to yeah, went to Catalan last year. Brilliant. Yeah, loved it. Oh, I've never been. I, I'm really amazed. So, what was? I mean, when I've whenever I've looked at it, it's been like the logistics that's put me off because you've got to fly, then you've got a bit of road trip, and you and all that. So, what was? What was you it can like? fly. To, you can fly quite close to Perpignan, but it's pretty expensive. If you want to get there cheaply, you're going to have to. Do a bit of a shuttle around robot. a little bit yeah. and maybe stay a little bit longer. But when you get there, the atmosphere down in the south of France is brilliant. I mean, they're mad for rugby league, absolutely mad. And the the I was having a trying to talk technical rugby league things to somebody who didn't speak any English and I speak very little French. So we were basically miming to each other <laughs> that that uh, Sam Tompkins had added some real injection of uh, pace into the back line in the Catalan season and uh, it was quite amusing. But oui, 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 oui. <laughs> but it's uh, my northern French is brilliant. I'll, I'll get I'll get really far <laughs> out. <laughs> Honestly it's great. I highly recommend it as a trip for people to go because uh, they they absolutely the fans love their rugby league they're mad for it and uh, and it's a great atmosphere. Well, what, 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 what do you mean the mad for it? Like the community around the stadium and that, are they yeah. all into it? Yeah, you know, they are. Like, they're like shops decorating the, the uh, shops in Catalan colours and flags everywhere. Yeah, like I mean, what? it's probably not like a, you know, like a, a, a Wigan on a game day maybe. Yeah. But, um, but the guys, who, the, the fans that turn up to the game, um, you know, absolutely love the game and they're real experts and, uh, you know, they talk really passionately about about the about the, the game, and it's just a nice. It's a great atmosphere. They've always got really much better quality food. You know, it's France, so they've got merguez sausages grilling away in the background, and you know, chicken and all that kind of stuff. And loads sounds of great. It's, hot yes. sun, and you know, you can, uh, you know, the sun's setting on the side, so you can you, you get a ticket that lets you sit pretty much where you like. So I was just moving around and avoiding the sun and chatting to people. It was brilliant. It's really good. Sold. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> yeah, so counters in. <laughs> French tourism board, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I've got, well, you mentioned Wigan there. So we've got um, we've got a, a girl from Wigan that's uh, staying with us at the minute, and uh, she's she's Chinese. So she, she, I said, uh, anyone that I meet that's from, like, you know, up north, I, I always ask them, are you into rugby league? Especially if they're from somewhere like Wigan, Leeds, you know, Huddersfield, wherever. Yeah. And I said, are you into rugby league? She goes, no, 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 not at all. She says, I remember when I was at school, <laughs> she said, one day, um, I got turned up to school. There was only three people in school and everyone had buggered off to Wembley. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was like, yeah, I can, I can yeah, believe that. In Wigan, definitely. I can believe that. Definitely. You know? um, okay, so that's... Uh, Just, that's uh, I was going to ask this game against France. I mean, What's your views, guys? Is it because it's usually pretty one-sided, men and women? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll spank the French usually. Uh, uh, maybe they're getting better. You know, there's some real good. But they French are. They, 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 this is my problem with France. They they are producing some great French players, yeah. and you only got to look at the Catalan side this yeah. year. They've got a great spine of yeah. French players the of the team in that France. Catalan team. And then they put an international shirt on, and they're bloody dreadful. No, but because they're basically playing Catalans, are you? You put it's England versus Catalans with a couple of Toulouse yeah. But look players. how good Catalans usually are. Yeah, but they're not an international level side, are they? Yeah, well, they're not going to take on England. Grand finalist, Challenge Cup winners year before. They, yeah, but they're still not no, going to be. No, I think it should my be point is they sh- they should be competing better than they they have been doing at international level. I always think the French side, but for whatever reason, let us down. So would, do you think there's like a psychological barrier yeah. there? Or yeah, yeah. do you think there's less of, like, a loss of, oh, no, a lack of passion? Or do you think it's the coaching setup? Because, yeah. you know, England have invested a lot of time in, in an extremely good coach in Sean Wayne who spent a lot of time on the culture and, you know, yeah. high standards for what playing for England means. And maybe playing for France just means putting a different shirt on on the weekend and maybe it's not, I don't know, maybe it's that. This, but but it's not that it's, it's um, getting one over on the English as well, isn't it? Yeah. Or maybe or do they just think, well, okay, we're that far behind, it, it's going to be a foregone conclusion. What? I'd, I'd I'd love to know the answer. Do you know the other thing I would like to see when this fixture takes place? I would like to see the England wheelchair v France same same, same triple same, header. Yeah, same weekend. That'd be great, wouldn't yeah, it? That'd be brilliant. Yeah, even a PDRL team. As well, yeah, a whole trip to South of France and and, and and yeah, we've we've got everything on. That'd be great to see. Be interesting to see um, if 
who's who's paying for that trip across there? I suppose England will pay for their own, their expenses, won't they? I don't know how it works on international, mate. No, I, don't, I, yeah. I haven't got a clue. Proper murky world of rugby league politics there you're opening. But when the, <laughs> when the game plays, the, 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 you know, the social media will be awash with rugby league fans saying, what a waste of time, waste of time, should be playing the French, we're just going to spank and we're just risking injuring our players. There'll be all sorts of negativity. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think we have to play the French because we have to have games and there isn't the funding clearly to send our lads to the other side of the world to play games mid-season. Um, and... You've got to hope that the more you play the French, the the more that gap will start to start to close. Start yeah, to close. So you know. Well, I think there's players out there that need rewarding with a cap as well. You know, because one of the things that's like if you if you've reached the pinnacle in your club, the, the next step is to play international. And if it's not available because you ain't got the games, yeah. you know, then you, then you're not going to retain players. And so I think it's it's required for more than just. You know, so we've got games. We still don't know if England are playing tomorrow, do we, either at the end of this year? It's gone a bit quiet, hasn't it? That's, yeah, it's been yeah quiet. that's been uh, rumbling on for a while. But yeah, ho hopefully we get more than just this one international this year. That was one of my standout moments from last last season of the podcast. We was in the press release, weren't we, after the Tonga game? <laughs> yeah. the, the, what was it, press conference? Yeah. And Sean Wayne was like, yeah, yeah, well, we'll play, we'll play some more next year and all this. And, and yeah, Christian, and then Christian Wolf, Wolf like, came on five minutes nope. ago and he went, yeah, they're not playing some more next year because <laughs> we're playing. And was like, oh, this is going well. <laughs> yeah, this is one of my standout Typical moments. rugby league uh, press so, release, this. So amateur, that. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the next. So, so the Williams Weekly. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the Williams Weekly this week is, we're, we're just going to have a little, little chat about the current halfbacks in the Super League and the question is who do you feel is the most influential halfback in Super League right now uh, or since the season started so um, Carl you've got you've picked out a few you've got a list of uh, some of the halfbacks yeah who I've picked it up well we can have a bit of a conversation you've got Sneed doing really well at, at um, Salford Lomax and Dodd at Saints George Williams having another golden season uh, who else we got? French, obviously, and Harry Smith at Wigan. There's just there's a whole list, mate. It's just uh, Mikey Lewis, another goal. You know, started where he left off last year. Uh, Theo Farge has now found his his role cemented in Catalan. Um, and then yeah, Drinkwater, Leon Hayes at, at Warrington. There's, right, so there's just a, there's loads there, mate. So here's my question then. So you've you've just run through the list there, but but before you heard that list. And you heard, you heard the question, who was your immediate thought? You know, who who come to mind straight away and why? Alex, we'll go to you first. Okay, George Williams. Yeah. Ooh. So I've been a bit lukewarm for a few years on on George Williams, but um, and I'm a, I'm a Warrington fan, so I'm a little bit biased, but I, uh, I think he's been one of the main reasons why Warrington's had such a good start to the season. You know, he... he, he uh, he will. He's, he plays a bit off the cuff, but he attacks the line really hard with the ball. He'll 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 take you know he'll take carries in when he needs to. He puts his puts his head on the line. So yeah, I think he's been really good. I think I think one of the things that gets me with George when I watch George Williams play, I'm just constantly watching his eyes because I don't think he does. He does like a no look pass for pretty much every pass. Yeah, it does. It's magical. You know what I mean? Where he just hits the target at speed in more or less in. You know the defender's line, and it's just like boom, out, out the back. Push it's just magic. His push supports just be the best. You know, yeah. anybody makes a break, he's there. Um, yeah, we're having a couple of little problems with cameras, sort of overheating at the minute. So, uh, so just <laughs> bear with us. You, you obviously you have got sound. So, uh, what do you reckon, Carl? Um, Williams, his defence has been absolutely incredible. Yeah. Well, my, straight away, I just thought Sneed. I just think, right. he's doing, I think he's just doing amazing things, like you know, and uh, and it, it was almost done when he when he lost Hull. When he left Hull, he was like, 
no one really expected a great deal with him. Now he's ranking really well in the Man of Steel awards. You know, he's bossing games, but not just bossing games. He's always been a great kicker, you know, an amazing kicker. But now, like, his, his ball play, whether it's just been highlighted because he's doing so well in, in this new team or not, I, d- I don't know, but he's he's just really stood out to me. And, and I think there's a lot of clubs out there. You know, you think about Wigan, Saints, maybe Warrington as well at times. Mm. The missing conversions, now that's two points. You know what I mean? And those two points count. And I think some teams are like, oh, well, if we miss it, it doesn't matter. We'll get enough tries. But other teams can't do that. And But Mark Sneed, you can pretty much rely on him to think it over the post yeah, every time. You know, it's, he, he turns four-pointers into six-pointers consistently. And that's massive. Yeah, well, you've... Uh, you- They, they get good value for money, don't they? Yeah. Uh, yeah they, they, well, they get the best out of the players, don't they? 100%. Absolutely, yeah. And and uh, uh, Sneed is, yeah, I think he probably has been the most influential halfback in the Super League this year because he's getting, he's get himself, he's getting the best out of the players around him who, who are, are not the the big money players that you've got at Wigan and Saints and, and Leeds. It's a fair... But they're doing well, aren't they? It's a fairly average side, but the, he controls that team really well. And I, I have to agree with you. I've got to go Sneed. He also doesn't play off the back of a a massive set of forwards who dominate. You know, they're a decent pack, but it's not like a... You know, it makes your life easier as a halfback, doesn't it, if you play off an enormous forward pack who absolutely yeah, dominates. Yeah, of course it does, mate. Forward. He's, Salford play more off the cuff, you know, unpredictable rugby, and, and his forwards will be giving him a decent platform, but, but not the best. So the fact that he's still standing out means he's... Yeah. I can't disagree with you guys. I mean, obviously, you've got Bevan French just having an absolute... You can't ignore him, can you? Amazing season, and he's just absolute dynamite. Well, that was just the easy answer to go for. Um, you know, he's in a star-studded team, but I suppose he is the he is the standout player at Wigan at the minute. Yeah, um, Alex, you had, a, you had a bit of a, a wild card as well, didn't you? You talked about Tyrone May. Yeah, well, so he came from Catalan over to, to KR, and I think, uh, I think he's been a really good combination with Mikey Lewis so you know Tyrone May gives gives Mikey Lewis a bit more of a freedom to roam around and be unpredictable and Tyrone May can play a little bit more structured and and uh, be that you know be in that slot position on the other side for for, for to, to to give an alternative to give it to Mikey on, on the other side so I think one of the reasons Mikey Lewis is playing well for for KR this year is because Tyrone May has been a really good and uh, you know you need that in a halfback combination. Yeah, of course you. You, do, yeah. you need a you need an unpredictable player, and then you need someone who can organise and be much more, much more safe. And uh, I think those guys tend to not get noticed. But I think he's done a really good job for KR. England shirt. Who do you reckon? Who do you reckon is probably going to get a, a nod for England shirt this year? Uh... Harry, um, Harry Smith, obviously. He's... Oh, yeah. I thought you meant like debut. No, debut. I mean like... Uh, in, in the halfbacks? Yeah, yeah. Smith and Lewis. That's what I'd like to see. You think over George oh, right. Williams? Oh, no, good point, yeah. You see, they, 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 there's, your, there's your dilemma, your England coach. Well, over George Williams because he's captain, isn't he? George Williams' yeah, captain. So. Yeah, yeah, Unless he rests him or, you know... No, it's going to be Harry Smith and George Williams, isn't it? Michael Lewis, third, third choice. The bench. Yeah. Maybe, but then Harry Smith and George Williams are play a very similar style. So I, I would go with one of them and Mikey Lewis if it was me picking the England team. Williams and Lewis, then maybe. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I, I, I nice don't think that's a nice choice, though. Yeah, 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 it's yeah nice. it is, it's, it's, not it, often it, England have a, a difficult choice to make. Not on that. Half. Not on the halfbacks. That's the, we always sort of, well, I'll, I'll say the Aussies. We haven't played bloody Australia for absolutely donkey's years, but we've always had a good English pack, haven't we? And, and that's the area we've, Always fallen a little bit short on his halfbacks. Oh, they've picked themselves, haven't they? Um, mm. But not now. Yeah, we've got we've got a choice, and that's good to see. It is um, right. Okay, so we're going to start wrapping it up there. Um, we just got a couple of things coming up in the future that we want to talk to you about. Um, also, I just want to thank everybody that's watched us tonight. I think we've had our record figures on there, like over over sixty on this YouTube live feed. Um, 20 odd in Twitter and all that kind of stuff. So thanks there's for tuning more, in. Mate, there's and, more, mate. There's more than that on Twitter. And, and viewing. Um, Carl, just a little bit of a look forward for, for this week. Yeah, so we haven't got a podcast episode this week because we're busy prepping for the Midlands Nines. Um, but then out of the blue, 
We've been invited on this other podcast, Craig. Yeah. Quantum Cast this Thursday. So the Staffordshire Quantums have now started their own podcast. Um, how can I talk about this with being polite? Well, uh, the best way to do it is to talk about some of the features that they've had. Right. So uh, on um, <laughs> on week week one's feature, main feature on the Staffordshire Quantums podcast it was... He's a dog. He's a dog and mammal. Right. That was week one's feature. I don't know what week two's feature was, but um, but it featured. Um, but, but it had Martin walking up the strip with a cigar in his mouth. In Benidorm, ben, in Benidorm with a cigar in his mouth. Uh, a chap with no top on eating a Chinese. <laughs> so uh, these are the levels we've got to get to this week. I'm, right. But I'm, I'm looking forward. It'll be an absolute blast. It's, it's actually really funny, mate. Unique it sounds unique, it, different to anybody else's. Yeah, I think unique is probably the best way of putting it. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to it because do you know what? You know, it, all right, that's some silly features and it's a bit tongue in cheek, but these guys have done amazing stuff for rugby league in the Midlands, <laughs> yeah. you know, and the, the, the driving force behind getting the, the nines going as well. You know, um, Matt, Martin is is volunteering on the day as well so you know if we can go on there and yeah they, and they, have, conversation they have invited us on to talk about the midlands nice because they have entered two teams you know a team that only set up 12 months ago have now entered two teams in into the nice competition and it was breaking news on last week actually they did have breaking news they had breaking news on last week's uh podcast that they're entering a team into the women's competition so this is brand new they're going to be their first games that they're going to play are going to be in the midlands nines yeah, can't wait. Uh, so remember, no podcast episode this week. Uh, however, there will be a, a prediction video, as always, and we're going to have Alex in that prediction video as well, so sharing his uh, take on what's going to be coming up in the Super League. There's some there's some interesting games there. There's there's one in particular where I'm like, I don't know where that's which way that's going to go. So make sure you tune into that. And for viewing tonight, thank you very much. Any final words, Carl? No. <laughs> Yeah, drop that. We did get over a thousand views though, on last week's um, prediction video, which, yeah, it's quality. which is outstanding. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Yeah, so until next week, take care.